the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I didn't do my normal opening prayer. You can tell how discombobulated I am by the time change. Um, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I was in coffee hour, and I was talking to Kengo. And there was this little moment when May came up to her dad. And uh, she's just at that right height where she can wrap her arms around his leg <laughs> as you're standing there. And I'm chatting, and she's just there. And it reminded me of being that height. I don't have vivid memories of that. But I remember being just that right height where you could go up to your parent and like put your arms around their leg. Do you remember? Yeah? No? Maybe? When I was that age, it was the late 70s. Um, and uh, for I am that old. Um, my sister called me an aging hipster this week. Um, but... I remember a voluminous dress that my mum used to have, like, like a big kind of like outskirt. I guess it was the 70s, um, and there was a thing. And I would kind of grab her leg sometimes, and then the dress would like enfold me. <laughs> it would like wrap around me. It made me think about the image of the hen putting her wings out and gathering the chicks in. I could be wrapped up in my mother's dress. And then I remember once being at a zoo, we were on a day trip, and there were lots of voluminous dresses around. Um, there were lots of people that had these big skirts, and I got all distracted and turned about and grabbed onto the wrong one. <laughs> and it was not my mother. <laughs> and then I suddenly realized and looked up and thought, that's not my mother. <laughs> and where is she? And I, I bawled. <laughs> I was four or five, I don't remember exactly. Um, and I felt lost and alone and scared for a moment. And she was like five paces away. <laughs> she was not far away. And I soon was found um, and back in the protective embrace of my family. So I think that image is at the heart of our gospel today. And I'm glad it is because the rest of the gospel isn't super easy. The image of a parent protecting a child, a hen protecting the chicks, that's what Jesus is saying is in his heart when he speaks to Jerusalem. I wish, Jerusalem, that like a mother hen, I could gather you under my wings and I could protect you. But you wouldn't listen. And how many of us wouldn't listen to our parents. You know, not all parents are perfect, I know that. But at the heart of the parental instinct, there is protection, the desire for safety for the child. And you could say that the heart of the prophetic message in Scripture, there is the same idea of protection. I want you to be safe, I want you to be well. That's why I say some of these difficult things. And that's at the heart of our faith and the heart of this season of Lent as well. God says to us, I want you to be well, I want you to be safe. So here's some things that you maybe shouldn't do. And here's some things that you should do. They're not arbitrary. They're not some capricious divine being just setting out rules for the sake of it. These are things that we are guided to for our well-being. You know, some people have said that we're obsessed with sin in the church. And you might think that that's true in this season of Lent because we've moved the confession to the beginning of the service and we really emphasize that and reflect on it and it's really the core of our liturgy at this time of year in particular. And it's there through much of the rest of the year as well. So people have sometimes said we're obsessed with sin and they think of that as a arbitrary set of rules that are there to uh, curtail our joy and fun. But I would like to offer that we are not obsessed with sin. We're obsessed with forgiveness. We're obsessed with reconciliation. We're obsessed with connection and love. But we do believe that you have to name the darkness in order to be able to overcome it. 
also we have this season of Lent in which we reflect on the dark struggles of life, on the things that can go wrong, and on the ways we can cause other people pain in order that we might let them go and reconcile ourselves to each other and to God and to love and to peace. You know, uh, at this nine o'clock service, we have the first reading printed for you, but we don't read it out loud because we have an intergenerational homily instead. And most of the time that's okay, but this time I would love you to go home and read that reading at some point because it's so profound. And I want to say that the reading of Abram hearing from God, having a vision of God and being told that he would have offspring when he was childless is a really key reading. It's key in some ways that you might not notice when you immediately read it. If you read it in the context of the spread of the first 15 chapters of the Old Testament, it's very significant. Abram's heard from God before, but he's never spoken back before. Apart from Adam in the garden, nobody's ever spoken back to God. This is the first time that somebody says something to God and a conversation takes place. So God says, I'm going to do this for you, Abram. And Abram asks two questions. He says, what are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? (laughs) And actually, that forms the pattern for the rest of the prophetic interaction between God and humanity for most of the rest of the Old Testament. Those two questions. What are you going to do, God, and how are you going to do it? And God then makes a covenant with Abram and says, your children will be as plentiful of the offspring of the, of the sun of the, sorry, of the stars in the air and the sand on the seashore. And he makes a promise he will be with him and that he will love him and protect him. And in that moment, Abram's terrified. Perhaps overwhelmed by the love that God's offering perhaps overwhelmed by the promise that God makes to be with him. And we have a whole thread of prophecy running all the way through the Hebrew Scriptures, and we finally get to Jesus. Some people might say that John the Baptist is the last in the line of the Old Testament prophets, but in a very real sense, Jesus is in this passage. The Pharisees come up to him and they say, Herod wants to kill you. Herod wants to kill you. There's some subtext here. I don't know exactly what it is that the Pharisees are trying to achieve. Do they love Jesus and they want to protect him? Or do they have an ulterior motive? Do they want to use this moment to silence him because his message is making waves and causing problems? They are saying your life is at risk because of your message, so be quiet, shut up, stop speaking. And Jesus says these wonderful words, you tell that fox, (laughs) I'm going to carry on casting out demons and healing people, and on the third day, I'm going to finish my work. And then he says, get out of my way, I'm too busy, stop trying to stop me, which is what makes me think that he is questioning the motives of the Pharisees. They don't really care about him. They're just trying to stop him. Get out of my way. I've got to get to Jerusalem. And he says these very difficult words because it's there that the prophets die. That's where I've got to get to. Reminds me of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. who recognized on his mountaintop sermon the night before he was killed, that he said, I think my life is in danger. I recognize I might not make it through. We kill prophets. (laughs) Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would that I have gathered you under my wings like a chicken gathers her hens. But you don't listen. And you kill the ones that are sent to speak to you. 
So I find myself in the middle of two really difficult polar images. There's this beautiful idea of the mother hen protecting the child, and this difficult idea of the killing of the prophets. And in the midst of that, I just want to ask you to contemplate all of the people that have come to you and perhaps said difficult things to you that would help if you listened to them, but who you've ignored. Maybe you haven't gone as far as to kill them. (laughs) That's an excessive image, perhaps. But there are people that we have turned our backs on, turned away from, not listened to. And really, like the prophets of the Old Testament, like the message of our faith, They've been trying to invite us to better ways of living for ourselves. And we've turned aside and ignored them. I don't know if there's someone you have in mind that once came to you and offered you that kind of a message and invited you to a better version of yourself and you didn't listen. It's a heavy thought, but please remember that the heart of it, God is coming to us in love and wants to protect and love us, wants us to know peace and wholeness. And I wonder if a moment will come when you can say, here is somebody who is coming to me. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord and is bringing me a challenging message that will help me to grow. Amen.